Welcome back to Canna Week, brought to you by New Frontier Data, where we deliver the week's top headlines in cannabis and hear experts weigh in on the impacts these stories are having on the industry. I'm your host, Tether Wickline. Today, we have two gentlemen joining us from RISE ETF. The first currently serves, um, runs the thematic research capability. Please welcome co-founder Rahul Bhushan. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for, uh, thanks for having me. Pleasure to be here. Absolutely. Um, and the second is the product lead, lead and also co-founder. Please welcome Stuart Forbes. Hi there. Hi. And our next guest is in charge of the extraordinary research team here at New Frontier Data. He is a regular here on Canna Week. Please welcome back our chief knowledge officer, Mr. John Kagia. Yeah, it's great to be back, Heather. Thank you. Thank you. Well, before we get started, guys, um, would one of you mind just giving our listeners who may not be familiar with RISE a quick rundown of who you are and what you do? Sure, um, I can do that. So um, I suppose we, we've, um, Rahul and I have worked together for a number of years now. Um, we started out life at ETF Securities, um, which is a very known, well-known ETF provider here in Europe, but we, we also had a presence in the U.S., um, and in, in 2014, um, we started um, building thematic ETF funds, right? So um, funds that were focused on specific sectors or themes. Um, and, uh, and that was really an area that we, that we were pioneers in, um, in Europe. So um, there was a lot of thematic investing going on in the US at the time, but not, not really in Europe. So uh, we brought that over here, built the first robotics ETF in Europe. We built the first cybersecurity themed ETF in Europe. Um, and then um, eventually the business was very successful, um, legal in general, um, a very, very large asset manager, household name over here, came along and bought that business. Um, and then uh, we decided that we wanted to continue the thematic investing um, specialty that we had as a team. And so the four founders of Rise, so myself, Rahul, um, and a couple other guys, Anthony Martin, Jason Kennard, we all left uh, Legal and General to go set up Rise. And um, this is where we're now focused very much on building thematic ETFs that provide exposure to you know, particular you know, emerging trends and themes um, that we see huge growth potential in in the future, including obviously um, cannabis and, and medical cannabis uh, specifically. Awesome. Thank you for that. Well, we have a lot to discuss, so we're just gonna dive right in. Um, today, sixgroup.com reported a new ETF issuer on the Swiss stock exchange, Six Welcomes Rise ETF. As of today, two more thematic ETFs with growth potential can be traded on the Swiss stock exchange, medical cannabis and cybersecurity. Congratulations, that's exciting news. Yep, yeah, it's great. Um, yeah, Switzerland's a, a very important market for us, always has been. Um, and, you know, it's a bit of a process to go through to get your funds registered in Switzerland and listed on the exchange, but um, hugely valuable once you're there. And, um, yeah, really looking forward to, to getting cracking in that market. Awesome. Well, if we can kind of pick your brain a little bit, um, we'd love to hear kind of your perspective on how, you know, given the unique regulations governing cannabis in markets around the world, how is it different setting up a cannabis ETF relative to establishing an ETF in another sector? Okay, so I, I guess the first thing to say is that, you know, we're a little bit different to most other ETF providers out there in the way that we build our funds. So most other ETF providers out there who build thematic ETFs, things that provide exposure to particular themes, they normally license an index from, from a, another index, from an index provider effectively. Whereas we actually build everything from scratch ourselves and we go and we look for experts in each theme to partner with, right? So for example, New Frontier Data is our partner for the, uh, for the medical cannabis ETF. Um, so that's the, the, that's the first thing. Um, but in terms of the, the particular challenges that you have um, with a cannabis ETF compared to a, any other um, theme are the, the legal implications of investing in cannabis. So um, I think that the, you know, the, the, the key thing that we sort of try to explain to investors here in Europe is that there are two different things. Um, on the one hand, you've got, um, you know, can, can we be involved in cannabis related activities in our particular country in Europe, right? Can we grow cannabis? Can we sell it? Can we distribute it? Can we do that even for medical purposes? Um, that's one thing. And the second thing is, can we invest in it, right? So if, if, if this part is illegal, is this part legal? And in many, in many cases, that is 
that is the case, right? So even where the actual cannabis business itself would be illegal in the particular country in Europe, or, you know, even if it's medical, um, investing in companies overseas that are engaged legally in their activities overseas is okay. Uh, and that's governed by anti-money laundering regulation in Europe. Um, and in Europe, uh, you, you may be less familiar with this, but if you're a member of the European Union, there tends to be certain that, that there's a whole suite of, of, of regulations um, and directives that govern um, you know, on, on a pan-European basis. And, and, and countries have devolved a lot of that sort of um, regulatory um, control to the, to the European Union as a whole. So, um, but then each country implements in slightly different ways. But what we find in Europe is that in most cases, they follow this, a very similar approach. And, and that basically says that, you know, you know, each country has its own, has the ability to legalize cannabis or not, or legalize a medical cannabis program or not. Um, and so you see some divergence there and you see certainly some countries moving towards legalization like Luxembourg. Um, Germany's already got a, a, a you know, very well-established medical cannabis access program. It's legal in the UK more recently. Um, so, um, but, but what we, what, from an investing point of view, what we've seen is a, is a big divergence with respect to the UK. So um, if you're a UK investor, um, you cannot invest in a, in a company that might be operating legally in Canada, even if it's in medical cannabis, um, if that activity would be Ill illegal if carried out in the UK. So you have to look at the actual activities that are being carried out in the relevant country where it's legal and compare that to what, what's allowed in the UK. Now, the, it's, it's not as simple as that. There's much more to it. Um, but in essence, that's what it is. Whereas in Germany, in Switzerland, in Italy, and a lot of these other countries in Europe, they don't have that same, um, that, that, those same sort of really stringent sort of restrictions. So as long as the activity is legal in say Canada, even if it's recreational cannabis that the company is involved with, um, then it would be um, a, a legal investment in, in, in Italy. Whereas in the UK, technically you would be money laundering by, by investing in that activity and repatriating dividends or capital gains associated with that investment. So, um, so for us, it was a real challenge to build this fund because not only did we have to take into account um, the, you know, the, the requirements around, you know, making sure that companies are operating legally in their respective countries, which is the, 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 the criteria that applies to most countries here in Europe, i.e. if the country's operating in Canada, that's fine as long as it's legal in Canada. They, if they're operating in the U.S., it's fine as long as they're operating legally at the federal level, right? So that means, you know, a lot of companies for us are out of bounds because they might be complying with Californian law, but they're not operating legally at the federal level, which means they typically don't have a listing on a major exchange um, and, um, and they would be an illegal investment um, for us here in Europe. That's, that, that applies across all countries. In the UK, we've got to go a step further and we have to make sure that we're only investing in companies that are sort of involved in, in, in the medical cannabis sector and the, you know, the, hemp, the hemp sector. So nothing that's, um, nothing that's sort of straying into the recreational cannabis space. Got it. Okay, so this seems very, very complicated. How do you kind of help, you know, curb any an investor's fears or kind of dumb it down for them so they're comfortable making these investments? So the, the, the whole idea of the, the, the fund that we built is we solve all of that for, for investors because you've got to remember, you try and explain this to, to an investor and their compliance team, they're just like, I'm lost. I don't, I don't know where to start. It's going to take me a year to get my head around this if I spend all my time looking at it probably going to have to get external legal advice. It's complicated. So, yeah. um, so that is, I mean, it, it took us a year to build that fund, right? So we have a, a 50 page compliance memo, which, you know, the structuring memo, which basically goes through all the regulations and all the different requirements. And what we end up with is a very rigorous multi-tiered due diligence process that we go through, um, with respect to the, 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 the companies that, ultimately feed into the index that our fund replicates, right? So what happens is from a very high level, um, we, we obviously exclude um, any company that is, is identified as a cultivation retail um, company by, by New Frontier Data. That's, a, that's a, a very easy exclusion that we can do. It's pre-classified. But then what we have to do with all the remaining companies is look at each one, carry out due diligence on it, look through its, its public statements, 
and assess whether it's involved in the in the recreational adult use space. If it is, we exclude it. The other thing we have to do is we have to make sure that company is operating legally in its relevant country. Now you might think, ooh, this, com this company's got a big listing on a major exchange and therefore it's fine. It's not necessarily. So just because a company has a, has a big listing doesn't necessarily mean it's fully compliant. And we've seen that with one or two companies and um, we have to exclude them um, on that basis. So we actually have a public um, uh, uh, exclusion methodology methodology that we publish on our website and at the back of that is an actual exclusion list um, and the methodology is, is objective it's 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 you know is the company operating legally in this in the relevant country you know is it involved in in um, recreational cannabis yes or no and then if it ticks either one of those boxes we then list it at the back of that document um, and that's public on our website so people can see why we've excluded a particular company. So the idea of this is to provide confidence and reassurance to investors when investing in this in this sector. And this is something that you know we had to agree with um, all kinds of different parties who are involved in the asset management ecosystem with us, right? So our independent depository, they have to be happy and comfortable because they're holding these stocks in custody for the fund. Right. Um, so they're the they're the they're the, the, the primary um, I guess party that we have to satisfy auditors. Um, stock exchanges, also the regulator that regulates the fund. So very important that everybody is happy with your arrangements. And then you go and get your fund authorized and then there's a lot more confidence in, in that whole structure. So we're basically solving this, this complicated legal problem for investors. Amazing. John, how does New Frontier play into all of this? How has your team been involved with Rise? John, you're muted. So we've had the pleasure of, of um, collaborating with, with the RISE team and actually providing them the lists of um, the leading publicly traded com uh, cannabis companies that then RISE uses to define who the, the um, companies which will be included in the ETF um, are, are going to be. Um, and given some of the dynamism that's, uh, that the cannabis industry has faced over the past 18 to 24 months, uh, obviously that list uh, has evolved in the time that we've been working with RISE um, but, you know, the, the onus is on us to, to make sure that, um, you know, the, the, the data we're providing RISE is, is um, timely, accurate, um, and, uh, and robustly curated to ensure that the inputs uh, that they're curating uh, to feed into the, into the ETF um, are, are reflective of, you know, the most up-to-date status of, of these companies, particularly given, um, you know, the, the regulatory uh, requirements that the Stuart has just articulated. Um, you know, this is a this is a, a high stakes game um, for the stakeholders, and and given the regulatory scrutiny that this industry currently is under, um, really important that, that the inputs that feed into the e ETF are right. So, um, that's where the burden of movement here comes in, responsibility comes in. Yeah, and it seems like this is something that the regulations are changing regularly <laughs> for all these different places. So it's hard to keep up and make sure that everyone's in compliance. Um, it's funny. It's yeah. It's it's actually you can explain it really simply in about thirty seconds. Um, it, but you either have that version or you have a half an hour, one hour version, which most <laughs> people just at the end of it don't don't remember. Um, so yeah. Well, you just went through a lot of the different things that you know standards for international investors and stuff. Where what are some of the areas where cannabis companies are falling short as far as leading investor expectations? Um, so I can maybe start, but well, maybe Rahul, do you want to take this one? Yeah, sure. <clears throat> so um, I guess the the short answer is promises. Um, I think uh, what you've what you've seen in the public markets is um, a lot of promises to to deliver certain ex ex levels of revenues, certain levels of earnings, um, certain sales growth, and um, I think there has been a, a sort of retail excitement around the industry as well in, in, in 2016, 2017 in particular, where these stock valuations have just um, you know, exploded to the point or ballooned rather to, to the point where you know, the, the expectations on the management teams have just become so high. And then that's resulted in obviously them not being able to, to, to deliver against those expectations. And so, 2018 and, and, and 2019 as well have, have really been a period of um, adjustment for the industry. I think uh, 
Um, there's been an adjustment. Uh, the, the investors have had to adjust to um, the reality. And I think the management teams have had to basically roll back some of their plans because they've realized that these ambitious growth targets, you know, perhaps expanding into Europe or Latin America or Asia or Africa, um, you know, perhaps their growth um, targets were, were a bit too ambitious. And so they've rolled back some of those plans. Um, the other thing with, with the cannabis industry, I think at the moment, and, and I'm speaking generally about the whole of the market, uh, in, which includes the cultivation and, and retail companies, which, which Stu mentioned, you know, come out of our ETF. Um, the other thing here is that, um, you know, the, the market has, has really um, experienced this, this explosive growth. But um, what, what's sort of, what, what hasn't happened yet is uh, banking reform. And so these companies, when they, when they need capital, they only really have one source to go to, and that is the equity capital market. And so investors, if you're an investor in a cannabis company, you know, if they're coming to the equity market every single time for capital, your, your, your shares are being diluted. Um, so your, 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 your investment is essentially deflationary for as long as these guys can't access debt. Um, and so there is, a, there is a little bit of a realization, I think, that's, that's happened um, perhaps first on, on the retail side and for the, let's say, more adventurous institutional investors that are participating in this market to think, okay, well, maybe, um, maybe the, the right time is, it, not, perhaps it's a good time to start cherry picking companies, number one, so that better capitalized companies that don't need to um, go back to the equity market as often. But I think the other thing that's happened is some people are, are just waiting on the sidelines um, to, and, and waiting for that banking reform to happen where these companies can, 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 can use leverage to, to, to grow. And of course, there's been you know, more and more companies like um, innovative industrial properties that have you know, performed these sort of shadow banking operations where you know, they, they do this sort of buy and then lease back much in the same way as you would do with aircraft. Um, you know, you, they, they're buying these warehouses as, and, and essentially you know, putting cash on the balance sheet of some of these cultivation companies. Now, of course, where, where we focus, um, it's, it's a slightly different area, of course, because it's the healthcare side of cannabis, it's the medicinal side. If you really start unpacking our product, it's, you, you very quickly realize that it's um, almost 70% pharmaceutical cannabis companies, if you include some of the big pharma names like Novartis, Teva, um, AbbVie, and um, Perigo, which are the, which are the four uh, big pharma names that come into our fund for a fixed allocation of 10% um, at, every, at every index rebalance. But, but really 70% being pharmaceutical cannabis. And of course here, the demand is, 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 is much more um, inelastic in because you know, people, are, people, are, people that need this, this, this you know, medicinal cannabis for, um, for health reasons, uh, whether we're in a good economy or in a bad economy, you know, if, you're, if you have chronic pain or if you have anxiety or if you have um, arthritis perhaps and, and you're using, whether it's the pharmaceutical option or the natural you know, hemp derived organic option, which, which, you're, use, which you're buying in, your, in, in Whole Foods or, or a shop similar to that, you, know, you, you need this stuff because it's, it's helping you. And, and you know, the demand you know, certainly is, is more inelastic. And as, as a result, I think that industry has been a slightly more resilient. Um, you know, a big affirmation for the industry has, has also this year been that um, cannabis has been deemed a, an essential business in, in the US. So if you, if you think about that, you know, it's, 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 a, it's really a, um, a sort of an affirmation by, by the state and the, and the lawmakers that you know, this is an important industry and you know, these patients really need um, this, this, this medicine. And so that's been exciting to see, and it's certainly um, provided some, some impetus, I think, to the, um, especially the medical side of, of the industry. Now, what's really interesting is that the medis medical side itself is quite, quite a, a small subsector within the larger cannabis ecosystem. And to, to use some numbers here, you know, we, the, 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 the data that we license from, from New Frontier Data is um, a list of 303 companies, but our ETF only hold, holds 27 of those. So you can see, um, you know, Stu talked talk in, in detail about that regulatory um, legal process through which the companies need to filter through to make their way into our fund. You know, 303 uh, you know, is, is, the, is the global cannabis ecosystem, 27 companies. So there, there really is a lot of filtration and there really is a process of trying to identify these companies that really are exposed to that healthcare tailwind in, in the cannabis space.
John, do you have anything to add to that as far as areas where cannabis companies may be falling short? Well, you know, I think Rahul is, is dead on and, and maybe just to, to expand a bit on this point about this transition that we've seen between 2018 and 2019 coming into the 2020 uh, through 21 cycle, which is, you know, the, the, there was a lot of irrational exuberance in the period in the industry between, uh, say, 2016 through, through 2018. And part of that, part of the reason for that, is because of how much retail investors were, were driving the market, and you know, people really excited about the prospect of cannabis. I think there were unrealistic expectations around how quickly uh, states were going to legalize cannabis, particularly major markets like the New Yorks and New Jerseys, Floridas of the world. Uh, I think there was un really unre unrealistic expectations at how national governments uh, were going to perform uh, in terms of ad adopting new legalization measures, both in the US and, uh, uh, and in Europe. And then third, I think there were very unrealistic expectations about how quickly these markets were actually going to materialize post legalization. And Canada, I think, has been a great a a example of that, where um, you know, the first 18 months of that market uh, post legalization, uh, its, its growth was much slower than, than uh, the most kind of Pollyannish or, or rose colored glass wearing investors had anticipated. But, you know, below that, I think there were some really serious investors, serious operators who were understanding that this was going to be a long term play. Um, and while the this initial kind of explosion that people expected didn't really materialize in, in many ways, um, it didn't actually neutralize any of the strong underlying fundamentals. And I think Rahul has, has, has spoken really uh, uh, eloquently to those, which are that um, the the science is strongly affirming the opportunity that medical cannabis represents. The the governments are realizing that not only from a public health standpoint, but from um, a, a kind of public return standpoint in terms of tax revenues, in terms of job creation, cannabis is actually a, 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 a positive, uh, is a net positive for, for local and, and state governments. Um, and that with this very dramatic shift we're seeing in public opinion, um, that there's, there's been this very strong public embrace of the idea of the role that medical cannabis in particular can play um, as a supplement or as a complement uh, to the pharmacopoeia that, that patients already have access to, and particularly as a displacement for um, some of the pharmaceuticals that we may be having issues with, uh, for example, opioids. So the opportunity, I think, remains really, really strong. And the mistake that some of the companies made early on about just being hyper aggressive in their expansion plans. I mean, you know, the fact that so many companies are now having to sell excess capacity, pull out of markets that they got into too early um, uh, uh, is a reflection of this recalibration that's happening. Um, but when you look at the, the long-term opportunity that we see uh, in cannabis, both on the medical side and then more broadly in, in the recreational side, um, you know, New Frontier's modeling uh, estimates that global total demand for cannabis today is at about $350 billion annually. That's just, that's largely recreational demand, admittedly. And so it doesn't include the opportunity that medical cannabis rep rep represent, doesn't include the opportunity that industrial hemp and its activation will represent and all of those downstream applications. So you can very quickly see how this starts getting toward a trillion op dollar opportunity when you start integrating all of these applications. And it, while we, we fully acknowledge that it will take a little time to fully capitalize on, on all of these applications, for the, the companies that focus on the fundamentals, that are realistic in their planning, that are bringing strong teams that um, uh, understand navigating emerging markets and understand navigating um, through resilient challenge, resilience challenging times, um, I, I think the, the, the long-term opportunities that we're going to see here are going to be very, very substantial. Uh, and the companies that get it right now, that figure out um, how to, how to um, build for the market as it currently is, but understands uh, the agility and responsiveness required for the market uh, that is coming, uh, will be very, very well positioned to be, to be the leaders and the vanguard um, in this, in the, in this long-term growth opportunity. Awesome. Thank you. Well, I couldn't possibly have an episode where I didn't talk about something COVID related right now. Um, so to the rise guys, um, you know, as we begin to see the COVID related economic contraction, what are your um, short to midterm outlook for cannabis public markets? 
So yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll take that. Um, I mean, I think um, we've we've obviously seen the bottom um, of, 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 of the, of the med I mean, I can speak specifically about the med medical market perhaps to begin with, and then we can kind of broaden from there with, with John's input as well. But I think um, on the medical side, you know, it's uh, it's been exciting to see since 2018 what's uh, what's been happening on that side of course in 2018 we saw um Epidiolex, um approved by the fda and and that drug um, or medicine um as, as some people prefer to call call these things medicine um you know got got approved and and and, and is, is now being distributed and marketed in in the u.s um recently was approved for 28 um in 28 countries by the european medicines agency so it's going to be rolled out um in in europe as well so the, the sort of medicinal story, I think, is, is, is live and well. In Germany, for example, you know, if you, if you are prescribed medical cannabis, it's now covered under an, under an insurance program. So that's obviously helped demand, and Germany is one of the biggest European markets. Um, but I think we're really at the tip of the iceberg here. And, you know, COVID or, or, or no COVID, I think, you know, you, we're still at the, at the tip of the iceberg. You know, we've got this, we've got this one medication, um, from from one company, GW Pharma, that's approved in two continents, um, and and I think you know, as as this sort of as our understanding of of other cannabinoids um, increases, you know, at the moment, um, I think we understand you know at best five or six five or six different cannabinoids, and not particularly well either. I mean, we understand them. Um, I think even you know at at very sort of surface level, but. We've, we've seen you know, some, some of these applications and we've seen certain cannabinoids work for certain conditions. But I think you know, that's five, if we understand five and, and if, with the understanding that there's over a hundred different cannabinoids in, in the plant, um, plus the flavonoids, plus the terpenes, um, and then you know, whatever else you, you, people might discover, combinations of, of these things. Um, I think that you know we are probably in over the next five to ten years we're going to see a lot more medicines come to the market. I mean, a lot of medicines are currently being uh, trialed uh, or in the in that sort of clinical process, going through the FDA life cycle. And I think as some of those medicines come to market, you know, you'll you'll see this um, the, the the sort of pent up demand that's waiting for alternatives to what's currently available. Is, is gonna sort of immediately jump at these new solutions. Um, and that's what we saw with Epidiolix. You know, I think there wasn't really any, any viable, scalable um, medicine prior to, prior to that to really address these, um, these seizures that, that were being experienced by patients. And, and, and you know, the uptake has been, has been incredible. You, even if you look at GW Pharma's revenues, they've, I think they've gone from you know, 15 million just two years ago to over 300 million today. Um, it's and that's happened, you know, in 18 months. So and, and on the back of one drug, right? So I think it's um, it's it's really we're really at the tip of the iceberg, um, and I don't think uh, you know the I think the pandemic ha is 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 you know may put some impetus behind you know how lawmakers and regulators think about the importance of the cannabis sector in within their states. Um, I think increasingly there's going to be a an interest in increasing tax revenues. Uh, for, using whatever way possible and, and spurring economic growth. But I think um, that's, that's kind of, that's a story that's happening at the, at the macro, let's say, but at, on the micro, you know, there's still research and, and, and development happening um, around the, around the med medical use cases for various cannabinoids. And that's certainly not slowed down. And I think that's going to continue. Um, and, and I think John, I, I mentioned some, I, I, I did read something from John actually a couple of, couple of weeks ago where, he even mentioned that there were some universities in the U.S. who have established um, academic cannabis programs that are now, um, you know, all allocating certain certain amount of um, budgets to 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 basically research and development of cannabinoids for the for medicinal use. So I, I do think that you know, um, while while the macro may sort of give a natural tailwind. Um, you know, we talked about tax revenues, we've talked about the opioids and, and how cannabis presents a viable, scalable, low cost, less addictive, uh, plant derived alternative um, for, for these patients. You know, I think at the same time, you, 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 you kind of have to think about, I suppose, the, the micro where, you know, the, these, these, the research and development hasn't stopped. And, and I think as time goes on, we'll unearth more use cases for various cannabinoids. Um, and that's going to result in, in, in more 
um, medicines and, and, and those medicines will, will target more conditions. Amazing. John, anything to add from you? Yeah, I, I think I would actually echo everything Rahul said, and, and maybe just a couple of points that I think are also worth considering in this context of um, the immediate applicability of, of cannabis as a wellness enhancement. So if you think about the, the one of the major consequences of the COVID pandemic has been to dramatically elevate the levels of stress and anxiety uh, in our society. Uh, and critically, we're actually seeing uh, globally reports of some of the most acute sleep disruption that uh, doctors who focus on sleep have seen in their lifetime. So people are, are deeply kind of uh, in, a state, in a deep state of disquiet because of um, the pandemic and, and its associated economic effects. Um, and there's, you know, there's, as one of the outcomes of that is people having a lot of trouble sleeping. Now, in the context of, uh, of that, given that the, the three of the primary reasons why people use cannabis or cannabinoids are to, to help with stress, to reduce anxiety, and to improve their sleep outcomes. Uh, we think this is a really kind of singular opportunity right now to, to elevate um, the recognition that, that, you know, cannabis provides a really kind of effective alternative to some of the pharmaceuticals in, uh, in alleviating some of the disquiet being caused by, by uh, the, the pandemic. And, and I think that's going to spur greater use. We're already seeing it in our data that demand over the past two months has, has gone through the roof um, in, in the markets that we're tracking. And we think that's part of the reason is, is people integrating it to, to just alleviate some of the stress and anxiety. And then second, you know, to this point of, of tax revenues, the economic stimulus of activating legal cannabis. Um, while we already think that that is underway in, in North America, we'll be following really closely what happens in, in some of the global markets which are being really, really battered by the pandemic and its shutdown. I think we're gonna start seeing as a result of this, uh, a much more concerted and robust discussion around legalization in markets globally. Um, and while that may not necessarily lead to immediate activation of more publicly traded cannabis companies, it, it catalyzes a, mo a more robust global conversation about an emerging global can cannabinoid economy. Um, and you know, as we see that play out over the next 18 to 24 months, you know, the fact that just in the past six to eight weeks, we've seen countries as far as Lebanon and Ghana um, uh, legalize, uh, legalize cannabis specifically for the economic benefit and for some of the medical applications for their local markets. Um, we think that brings a lot more seriousness to, to stakeholders who might be on the sidelines who recognize that um, even if there may only be a handful of real robust players uh, in the legal markets today, as you start seeing more companies activate these, these markets, the opportunity to, to build a robust global ecosystem grows. And with that, so does the market opportunity that this uh, uh, industry will represent. Awesome. Stuart, anything to add? I know these guys pretty much covered it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's no, no stone left unturned, I don't think, by John there. <laughs> um, so, um, yeah, I think, yeah, we're, I mean, we're excited to see what's going to come in the future. Um, you know, I think one of the areas that we're keeping a close eye on as well, um, in conjunction with you guys, is obviously what, you know, specifically in the medical um, sector, is what Big Pharma is doing. So, um, you know, I think you know, there's obviously every every pharmaceutical under the sun has filed a whole lot of patents and everything else. Um, but what we're interested in and where companies are making a bit more of a, I guess, taking a bit more of a serious step into that. So we've seen um, one of Novartis's um, subsidiaries enter into a distribution agreement with Tilray. You know, this is the kind of thing that isn't going to happen lightly. Right. So Novartis isn't going to allow um you know one of its subsidiaries just to lightly enter into a, a global distribution agreement with a cannabis company um that absolutely would have been signed off at the top levels risk committees global risk committees um steering committees whatever you want to call them at novartis right so um we've seen the same thing um i believe it's with tiva um and um i think we'll see more of these um as these companies sort of slowly dip their toes in and, uh, and, and you know, before diving in entirely, they'll they'll dip the toes in slowly. But these companies, we're keeping an eye on, and we 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 expect to see more of that as we as we continue. And maybe just a quick kind of dovetail off of that, which is that as you you know, we've talked a bit about the implications of the 2020 election. Obviously, there's quite a number of states that are looking at both medical and adult use uh, initiatives in the U.S. But 
I'd actually be watching very closely the congressional uh, uh, makeup of the incoming cohort in the 2021 congressional cycle, because I think that's going to be critical in determining whether uh, in 21, 2021 we will see um, federal relaxation of uh, banking rules for cannabis businesses. Uh, I think it is becoming increasingly untenable to, to say that this is you know, a nearly $20 billion industry in the US and it still is unbanked. Um, and if we do see reform at the national level, regardless of what happens at the, pre on, at the presidential level, um, this is going to be a congressionally mandate driven initiative. And if we see um, uh, a relaxation of banking rules, the ability for, for uh, cannabis businesses to now have full faith and credit, full participation in the, in the um, global banking ecosystem, then I think that becomes another major cal catalytic event um, to, to both the ability for companies to, to be publicly traded, but also with the seriousness with which um, institutional investors can start to look at this industry. Awesome, thank you for that. Well, this is um, a good place. We'll leave it here today. Thank you all for joining us today at Can A Week. Um, please be sure to like and subscribe to the podcast. You can find these news stories and more on New Frontier Data's Cannabis Insights Daily. Um, thank you again to our guests and listeners. And I'm your host, Heather Wickline. We'll see you next time. <laughs>